So everyone, welcome. Uh, welcome to our session, an info session, learning about field experiences here in Special Collections and University Archives. Just to give you a heads up on what we're going to do today, I'm going to give you just a quick overview of who we are, what we do, what opportunities exist, and how you might take advantage of them. And then I'm going to leave a lot of time at the end for questions. If anyone has any questions, you're welcome to ask them here. You can chat, you can raise your hand. Um, if you're not comfortable asking a question or you don't quite have the question fully formed yet and you'd like to email me, my email is also going to be on the screen as we go along. So I guess to start, I should actually introduce myself. My name is Erin Larimore. I'm the University Archivist and Student Engagement Coordinator here in Special Collections and University Archives. And now I'm going to try to share my screen, which will hopefully work and you will all be able to see the lovely PowerPoint presentation. Hopefully that pops up properly for everyone. Field experiences in SCUA. So I just for those of you who don't already know, SCUA is just the acronym for our department, Special Collections and University Archives. Um, we're part of the university libraries here at UNCG. And like I said, my email address is on this slide. It'll also be on the final slide. So know that you'll get that. You'll also get a recording of this session um, emailed to you if you feel like you need to go back and go through anything again. So let's get started with the quick intro. Again, here's our agenda. We're just going to run over what is SCUA? Who are we? What field experiences exist? What are some of the limitations to field experiences with us? how you'd go about applying for a field experience with SCUA, and some final tips and takeaways. So we're gonna start with what is SCUA? We're the Martha Blakeney Hodges Special Collections and University Archives. So as I mentioned before, we're a department within the UNCG libraries. Under the umbrella of our department falls a number of different collection areas. Um, University Archives, which is the area that I uh, supervise is focused on the history of the university from its founding through today. Our manuscript collections are focused primarily on local history, but also on women's history and some other areas um, that tie into the university's research areas. We do have a specific collection focused on women veterans historical project. This is specifically focused on women in military service who are American women in military service. And so um, this includes oral history interviews as well as collecting materials um, related to those experiences. Your fun tr trivia fact for the day, we also have the world's largest cello music archive and we have researchers from all over the globe who email us or who come in to do research here. And then we also have a pretty extensive rare book collection. And the rare book collection, subject-wise, um, really reflects the history of our university, which is uh, we were founded as a women's college. And so lots of books about women's history, women's health, women's fitness. Um, we also have some sub-collections that are focused on things like women in detective fiction and girls' books in theories, uh, things like Nancy Drew. And so all of those fall under the umbrella of special collections and university archives. Not on this slide because um, we're in kind of a weird transition period right now is also preservation services. And that's preservation services for both our department and for the library as a whole. As many of you may know, the library is actually on the very, very front end of a pretty massive renovation project. Um, and our preservation lab is part of phase one of that renovation project, which means that to be honest, as we're speaking, some of the moving, physical moving of materials have started. And we're not quite sure what the timeline is going to be for that to be completed and for uh, field experiences to be available with preservation services. But um, if that's an interest area, let me know. We can see what we can do, or I can even introduce you to folks at other local institutions who might be able to help you. So field experiences in SCUA. I do want to kind of field experiences, I will be honest, is a term I made up. <laughs> um, it encompasses all academic credit, credit based learning opportunities across campus and across departments. So depending on what department you're in and depending on what kind of experience you're searching for, it may be called an internship, a practicum, a capstone, an independent study. 
regardless of what it actually is called by your department, consider it for the purposes of working here in SCUA as a field experience if it's for credit. This does not include volunteer work in the department or student work that's paid on an hourly wage in the department. Um, again, this is academic credit based learning opportunities in our department. It could involve any aspect of work in the department. Um, as many of you may know, in a special collections and university archives like ours, we handle a lot of the work with our collections from front to back. So if you think about departments within a library, you'll often have access services, you'll have technical services, you'll have reference and research services. Here in Special Collections and University Archives, we handle all of those aspects of the work within our department. Um, so we're acquiring materials, processing them, making them available to researchers. Um, any of those aspects of work fall under our department. A field experience could focus on one of those, or it could focus on multiple aspects of the department. And in theory, it could also include collaborative work with other departments in the library. For instance, digitization is actually headquartered in another department within the library. It doesn't mean that we couldn't potentially uh, build a, a field experience that combines the two, but um, it doesn't. It's not technically part of our department, if that makes any sense. Even if most of the materials that are being digitized may come from our department. I'm going to give you some examples in a minute of some field experiences that have taken place in the past. Um, both of these are experiences from LIS students, um, but I find that they often would work for public history or any of the other departments as well. I will put the little note at the bottom because people come from different departments and have different requirements from those departments in terms of what they have to do. I will say it's the responsibility of the student to ensure that the field experience aligns with your department's guidelines in all ways, shapes and forms. How many hours you work, how often you have to meet with your faculty advisor, what type of journal or diary or papers you may have to complete along the way, what the final outcome and product is, what kind of reporting has to be done. Whatever your department requires, we'll work with you to make sure that that gets done, but it's up to you, the student, to ensure that all of that is being coordinated and completed on time. So for a couple of quick examples about um, some past experiences that were in our department. The first, we had a student who came to us who she wanted to learn how to create a digital exhibit. That was her main thing. I want to learn how to create a digital exhibit. The idea we ended up coming up with in conversation was that she would create a digital exhibit that complemented a physical exhibit we had in our reading room here in the library. Ultimately, we set a few goals for that project. She wanted to learn some new technology. Omeka is a um, collection management software that also has an exhibit function. WordPress is, you know, basic website construction. She also wanted to practice metadata description. She had learned some in class, but she wanted actual practical application of that. Omeka runs off of Dublin Core, and so we decided she would get a chance to practice Dublin Core. And she wanted an opportunity to conduct primary and secondary research that helped provide additional contextual information about the exhibit and about the exhibit's items. Um, I'm a big proponent of the fact that if you're going to work in an archives, and assist researchers, You, it really is helpful for you to have done some of the research or some research on your own. Um, if you can put yourself in the researcher's shoes, it, it's a really great experience to have. And so this student wanted to have all three of those as her project goals. And we built a project around it that was focused on creating a digital exhibit, focused on a physical exhibit that we had. Ultimately, in the end, she produced a publicly available website, awesome digital exhibit that complemented the physical one. She also did a presentation about her digital exhibit as part of the exhibit curators talk that we held at the end of the semester. And so it was an opportunity not just for her to complete the project, but for her to talk publicly about the work that she did and honestly to get uh, awesome feedback and people to tell her how great her work was <laughs> um, as part of, of that work. So a second example 
Uh, this was maybe about a year ago. We had a student who wanted to learn how to process an archival collection. She had never physically worked with archival materials before, so she wanted to learn how to arrange and describe a collection and create a finding aid. So we worked with her. We identified a collection, the records from UNCG's International Program Center, that she could um, she could arrange and describe those materials and that it would take about a semester to do that. That's another key that I'll talk about later when we get to limitations. But the project goals that we set for her was first, she was going to create an intellectual arrangement for the collection. She was going to come up with how to organize it without physically moving stuff around. And then she physically processed the collection. She moved things into that physical arrangement. That also included rehousing the collection into acid-free boxes and folders. She also made notes on preservation concerns. She wasn't doing the preservation work, but she was noting issues that she saw along the way that could be addressed in the future. And then she created a finding aid for the collection, a finding aid that's available online and has her name credited as the finding aid creator. So this publicly available finding aid for the collection was her big final product. But she also created a blog post about one of the topics she found while working through the International Program Center's um, papers. So our Spartan Stories blog is a blog that's focused on short stories about university history. Any of you who've actually worked in archives and processed archival materials will know that you would be hard pressed to process a collection without finding at least one thing along the way that's interesting um, and that kind of piques your curiosity. And so we wanted to give her that opportunity to not just share the finding aid, but share a story from the collection that she had learned during her work. And she did that as part of the Spartan Stories blog. So I mentioned a second ago limitations, and I do want to talk really quickly about some limitations that come with our field experiences. First is the major caveat that availability of field experiences is based on our departmental priorities, as well as the individuals who work here, our time limitations and prior obligations. If a person has already committed to working with one student, um, they may or may not be able to take on two students in one semester. We take the process of working with students on field experiences very seriously. We consider it not just a training experience, but a mentoring experience where you're learning about the profession. And, and we take seriously our responsibility to help guide, guide you through that. Um, and so we can't be overcommitted and still do that. And so that's always a caveat up front with any of these types of projects. I also want to mention SCUA's hours of operation. We're not open the same hours as the library. Technically, our reading room is actually only open for researchers Monday through Friday between 9 and 4, but we typically have uh, faculty and staff on site Monday through Friday between 8 and 5. So typically, we let students come in during those time periods um, to work, but those are stricter limitations and um, might not always work if you're a student, for instance, who works full time. I do want to say, though, virtual field experiences are possible, but not for everything. With the two examples that I provided earlier, the one focused primarily on creating a digital exhibit was done primarily virtually. The one focused on processing a collection, however, the actual process of arranging and describing a collection requires you to have your hands on the materials, and that requires you to be on site and on site during our hours of operation. So these are just some examples. Um, field experiences typically work for things like creating research guides, digital exhibits, digital stories, which includes timelines and story maps social media, things like that, things that are largely drawing off of materials that we've already digitized work really well for a virtual field experience. Things that don't work so well, I'm not going to say they're not possible in some way, shape or form, but they might be challenging to do a complete practicum or complete field experience around um, virtually are things like processing, arranging and describing a collection, digitization, the physical process of scanning and creating metadata for materials. Preservation, hands-on preservation work um, doesn't really translate quite as well to a virtual uh, environment. So, you know, if you think about something that really is heavily hands-on, those often don't translate well um, to a virtual experience. 
we might could work them if you know someone is available to come on site half of their time and work virtually the other half of the time we may be able to work with that a little bit more easily but 100 percent virtual things that are hands-on that that's a really challenging thing to do and it might actually in that case be a better opportunity to look at something that's closer to where you, phys you physically are or that has maybe broader hours of operations than we do. So how would you go about applying for a field experience here in SCUA? Um, we get lots of emails from students every semester asking about the possibility of working with us. And one of the reasons why I wanted to do the two info sessions that I'm doing this semester is just to help folks know kind of how things work here and the easiest way to get in touch with us and honestly, the best way to set yourself up for success. So there's some things to think about in advance. Um, you know, if you're if you're sitting there thinking, I want to work in SCUA, I want to do a field experience there. Think specifically about what you want to get from a field experience in SCUA. Um, what experiences when you look at your resume? Where where do you see gaps? Where do you see things that you know that people are going to be looking for, but that you just don't necessarily have practical experience doing. Another way of thinking of that might be what aspects of your classwork did you enjoy, but that you haven't gotten a chance to apply in a real world setting. And then finally, what does your department require you to do to get credit for the field experience? Think through all of those things about and, and then think about them contextually. How, how might SCUA help me do that? Because ultimately, that's what we want to do. We want this to be an experience that works for us, of course, but also one that works for you, works for your goals, works for you in your future quest to get a job. Um, these are the key things, and so they're important things to think about before even applying for a field experience. Be honestly, be it here or anywhere else. So if you think through all of that and you're really like, yeah, SCUO would be a good opportunity for me. Steps to apply, super easy. Just email me. My email's right there. And like I said, it'll be on the final slide too. E-R-L-A-W-R-I-M at uncg.edu. And in your email, let me know your name, your department, um, what you're looking for, just generally speaking, in terms of a field experience. To go back to those previous examples that I had, the general, the general, what you're looking for might just be, I want to create a digital exhibit. That's perfectly legit. That's something we can work with. Um, if there's a specific reason why you think school would be a good place for you to do that, let me know. And that could be, you know, I took a class with where one of the folks from school came and talked and it just sounded fascinating. It could be, I don't have a car, and so I'm only limited to things that are on campus. Let me know, uh, you know, what that might help you out with. And then let me know what semester you're going to be doing your field experience. People tend to contact us um, in the semester before they want to do the field experience. So, for instance, right now in late October, I'm getting some emails about spring. I'm also getting a few about summer of 2025. Um, so. I would say by the middle of the previous semester, you're going to want to reach out and have a conversation. And part of that reason is because simply emailing me, I can't, I'm not the person who automatically will just say yes and no and connect you with um, a field experience. When you contact me and you provide me with that information, I'm going to work with my colleagues across the department to help find some mutually beneficial opportunities for you and for your supervisor here in our department. So again, that may be limited based on the availability of specific people and their times. Honestly, like if someone knows that they're going to be teaching a class every Tuesday morning and Tuesday morning is the only time you have to physically come in, that may not be the perfect pairing uh, for you. And we may need to look for something else. Um, but that's step one is my I do my matchmaking and try to find a match that works for everyone um, across our department and works for you and your academic needs. If that match is made, then I work with you and the supervisor here in our department to set up some goals and objectives as well as your work schedule. 
then you and your supervisor here in the department, y'all work throughout the semester on your project. I'll check in with you on a monthly basis for updates and feedbacks, and I'm always physically around too. But um, ultimately, you would be working one on one with whoever your field supervisor is. And then at the end of the semester, I work with both of you on coordinating end of the semester reporting back to the academic department. And that varies by academic department, but I'll work with you to make sure that whatever we need to do, whatever we need to fill out, whatever we need to complete, that all of that is done and done on time and done completely so that you don't have to worry about nagging us <laughs> at our and your supervisor here. That doesn't have to be something you need to worry about. Once, once I know that that needs to be done, it's on the calendar and it will, it will get done. So I'm going to give you some final quick takeaways and tips, things, things to keep in mind if you are interested in working here for a field experience. First, like I mentioned before, don't wait until the last minute. Um, like I said, we get lots of students who contact us, and the sooner you can contact us to let us know you're interested, the better chance of us finding a match for you because it'll give us more opportunity to think through possibilities, to think through availability, and to and to find the right thing for you. Also helpful in doing all of that is for you to be able to articulate what you want out of the experience. Ultimately, again, that's what we want. We want you to get what you need out of the experience. So think about what it is you need and think about how we might be able to help you get there. And then we'll work with you in terms of what we need and what we want <laughs> and find that happy medium that works hopefully for everybody. And finally, if you have questions about guidelines and specifics, communicate with your departmental advisor about the academic department's requirements. Ultimately, you wanna make sure you also get your academic credit for this. And so that's just kind of a fail safe to make sure that that happens in the end. Here in the library, we can't, we aren't the ones who actually provide academic credit. So we have to work with the uh, academic departments in the College of Education or the College of Arts and Sciences or other schools on campus to ensure that everything is being completed um, for you to get that at the end. So that is the quick overview. Again, my email address is there on the screen, E-R-L-A-W, R-I-M at uncg.edu. I'm going to stop sharing the screen and come back out to this grand collection of folks and ask if anyone has any questions. Um, any questions about how to apply, what opportunities are available. Um, I'm happy to answer anything now or via email if you'd like to, to answer me later. If you raise your hand, I'll unmute you. Um, or you, you may be able to unmute yourself. I'm not 100% sure. Um, but um, just raise your hand if you have a question or type something into the chat and let me know. I will say you don't have to. One of the questions that was asked in the previous session that I thought was a really good question, and I meant to mention this earlier, um, someone asked if you had to have prior experience working in archives or in our department to, to do a field experience here, and the answer is no. Um, you don't. We, again, we see ourselves as the place that helps provide that experience. A class, we can help you apply what you've learned in the class. Um, things like that. So you do not have to have a prior prior work experience here or in any other archives or um, library. Um, we just want to know that you're interested in the field and that we can help you kind of move forward with that. I'm going to pause for one more time to see if we have questions or anything in the chat. Again, click the hand raise button if you have anything. Awesome. No, I thank you all for coming. I really do appreciate it. Again, I'm going to type my email into the chat too if you need it. If you have any questions, if anything pops in your head as you move along, 
let me know. I'm happy to help you out. I'm happy to talk through what we do, if that's even a question, if it's a broad question of what happens here. Just let me know. We can we can work things out and and figure out how best to uh, get you whatever experience it is that you need. But anyways, thank you all for coming. I hope you have a good rest of your day. Enjoy the nice weather and um, hopefully we will uh, see some of you soon. Thank you.